what is up back again with the two tall sports podcast thank you for joining me today as always love to have you and uh, got another fantastic episode for you uh, today my guest is jeremy wolf he is a former minor leaguer uh, he was a division three all-american and uh, he's originally from scottsdale arizona he actually formed a an organization called more than baseball which is a nonprofit that's there to help minor league baseball players that are struggling or that got released or you know basically the the non-glamorous life of minor league baseball guys need equipment they need food they need you know stuff to live with you know they, they need help so uh, more than baseball is a, a great organization that he and some former baseball players created and they've you know infiltrated mlb and they're, they're making a name for themselves now and it's a great cause so Check out morethanbaseball.org. And this episode, the second half of the interview is going to be all about that. And the first half, we're going to talk about his background. And uh, this is a fun one. I think you guys will enjoy this one. Uh, he's, he's a really funny guy. So uh, my guest is Jeremy Wolf, and um, you'll you'll enjoy this episode today. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. You can email the show, twotallsportspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. Please subscribe and hit the bell notification to let you know every time there's a new episode out, which is every Thursday. Uh, we'd love to have you subscribe, drop a comment, like, share it with a friend. That'd be awesome. Just trying to grow the page a little bit. So uh, if you want to watch the interviews, that's on YouTube. On the audio side, it's going to be Apple Podcast. If you could, when you get to Two Tall Sports Podcast, uh, when you're on Apple Podcasts, scroll all the way down and find those five stars. Go ahead and hit the five star if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, we're also on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music, Google Play, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. And uh, support the show. So just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast and you'll find me there. Uh, I also post clips a lot every week on my social media. So go ahead and hit me up there. Uh, you can check my LinkedIn. Uh, you can just search for me directly or my Instagram is where I do a lot of uh, activity on that as well. So anything you can find on Two Tall Sports Podcast. Enjoy the episode with Jeremy Wolf, and I'll see you on the other side. Two Tall Sports All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a former minor league baseball player. He was drafted by the Mets in the uh, 2016 draft out of Division Three Trinity University. He was part of a championship team there at Trinity, and he hit over 400, and he was All-American, All-World, everything. So he was a superstar in Division Three baseball. Uh, he and I both were, have been a part of Team Israel at different points in time, whether it's World Baseball Classic or the soon-to-be Olympics this summer. Uh, but more importantly, he's also the co-founder of a nonprofit called More Than Baseball, providing resources to minor leaguers and former players. He is Jeremy Wolf. What's up, Jeremy? Thanks for being on the show. Hey, buddy. Thank you so much. I, we're going to save the, the intro because my mom needs to hear that. She'll be very <laughs> proud of me. Everybody needs an intro to you know remind people who they are. I, honestly, that might be my new ringtone. <laughs> okay, go, <laughs> hey, go ahead, dude. Or when people call, like, make sure you know who you're talking to here. Uh, when they call, hey, yeah. this is Jeremy Wolf, uh, yeah. former All-American, All-World. <laughs> I'm like, yes, that's my phone. Oh, man. Definitely, Nate. Feel free to take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've done a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff, man. You have an interesting career. Um, and, you know, and also you're a podcaster, so that's pretty cool. I wanted to give you a chance to mention that. Um, with former big leaguer and a former minor league teammate of mine, Chase Darno. Uh, the show is called The Grind. So real quick, before we get to your background, how long have you been podcasting and uh, what's The Grind all about? The The Grind is mine and Chase's exploration into like the lives and journeys of professional baseball players. Uh, we interview current and former professional baseball players. And we actually started to interview more writers and more baseball personalities because they don't just appear on the national stage they too go through the grind of minor league baseball or, or at the lower levels of their profession. We did Emily Walden, uh, who's a writer with now with the athletic, but did like Detroit free press in the minor league covering the minor leagues for the last 10 years. And so yeah. sh they see baseball. We, we have conversations about baseball and why baseball matters and why baseball is important. And uh, I think it's just, everyone's got a podcast. Sure. But I, I think it's a lot of fun. I can see why everybody, that's one now. Sure. Yeah, no, hey, that's why I'm doing it too, man. It's been great. It's been good to reconnect with people, but also yeah. like get stories you would have never heard before. That's what I want this to be. 
Yeah. And no one's covering, like you're covering minor league baseball. You did it. And, and you're bringing people on who did that, had that lifestyle. And we want to do the same thing. The, the stories that guys have to tell is really important. And we want to give them a space to do that. Right. Exactly. Um, and we'll definitely get to more than baseball in a little bit, but I want to talk about your baseball career first. Um, you're originally from Scottsdale, Arizona, which is of course a hotbed for baseball players and talent. There's a lot of good players that come out of there. Um, when you were in high school, and I think you guys won a couple of championships when you were in high school, how did you see yourself, you know, as a player and, and kind of what kind of player were you? And did you think you had a chance to play at the next level? Yeah, I could always hit. I was a left-handed hitter. I could play the field relatively well. I didn't make throwing errors. Like uh, I was always an outfielder. Okay. Honestly, always a left, always a left fielder. Okay. Right. Luis Gonzalez was my favorite player growing up. I had the open stance. I was lefty righty. Like uh, I loved, I loved that just being like, oh, who's in left field? Like having that be my position. Someone says it's the only position I can play. Sure. That's totally fine. Uh, but out in Arizona, like there are so many good players. In my class was Dylan Cousins who got drafted in the second round. He was uh, he hit ahead of me in high school. There's Chance Adams who's now in the big leagues. There's Zach Gibbons who was uh, got to AAA with the Angels. There was uh, I think the Kingeries were around. I think Kevin C Kevin Crone was around. Like Jamie Westbrook, studs, man. And so doing the travel ball circuit and the 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 summer ball circuit, like just I just tried to keep up. Yeah. And. I, uh, I was so committed to playing in college that the, 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 the way that I went through high school as like, you know, I'm hitting four, I hit, I think I hit like 400 in high school, whatever, but like, didn't get a look. Trinity was my only option. You told called and said, Hey, do you want to walk on, uh, your junior year? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I want to go. So I want to play. Trinity University Division Three in San Antonio uh, called me and my best friend, and then two guys from Brophy, who's our rival high school, actually played them in the state championship game. Oh, okay. And they go, "Hey, uh, you know, do you want to come to Trinity? We're going to win a national championship." And I said, "Yes." I played every game except for four because I forgot the signs. But, <laughs> but, but my gr the grind of high school baseball in Arizona and in these hotbeds is if you're not going to get looked, go somewhere where you can play because. If you're keeping up with those guys who go Division I, uh, ASU, U of A, get drafted, you're good enough to play college baseball. And so I always knew that that pushed me. Going through that as a 16, 17, 18 year old baseball player really pushed me to continue to, to still be doing it today. Right. Well, because I mean, I was going to ask you about, you know, of course, Arizona and ASU are there, and you got all the big schools on the West Coast, and you're hitting 400 at a, a well known high school. Did you, I mean, I, I'm surprised you didn't get any looks, honestly. When you're on yeah, good teams, too. you get looks, you know? Yeah, me too. It must have been something. Yeah. Right? Looking back on my career, like, I'm not the fastest. I played a good outfield. Yeah. I hit left-handed. Yeah. But I don't know if I had the body. I don't know if I didn't run well enough. Uh, but when you see, when you look back and see, like, who did go to ASU U of A? Yeah. Studs, guys. Right. I was never a guy. I was always consistent, uh, you know, good chemistry guy, good team guy, whatever. Right. Um, but division three was like where I needed to be. It, there was no scholarship in, in baseball. There's really no college scholarships. That's a whole other podcast. Right. Right. But uh, I really, I look back and say like, okay, division three, I played every game. The guys that went to ASU U of A, like one of the best players I ever played with in high school played like 10 games at ASU. Yeah. They, they bring in like 30 or 40 guys every year. They bring in 30 guys, they give you 10% scholarship enticing you to go there. And then they bring somebody else that's better. Yeah. And so he was screwed. He transferred and lost a year. And like, I played every game and I'll take Which that over. Which is important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you, I mean, you were great in college. Like I mentioned, you were, you know, all American and you guys won a D3 national championship, just like the coaches told you. So all that stuff came true. Um, what was it like when you were at Trinity going to school there, just the school side and also the baseball side? <laughs> I don't know if I went to school. No, I did. I majored in baseball, though. And sure. I, and I, that's and what I tell people. I was really close with the professors. The professors were like, okay, you're an athlete. I'm going to have to keep an eye on you. But I did the work that I needed to do. I really like school. Yeah. I really like studying the things that I did. I studied marketing and design and uh, photography. And I liked that. I liked that was my part of my, uh, my education. Uh, 
but I went to Trinity to go to get drafted. So like, uh, not morning workouts, but like before practice workouts, uh, practice, you know, all of that, the, the four years of college baseball plus summer ball, like that's a lot of baseball in four years. And I love every second of it. I, I lived it up as much, as much as I could. Uh, and it's, did you ever visit Trinity before you went or you just was, just went? Yeah, I, no, I visited, it okay. was the night, it was the night after prom. So my mom picks me up from my friend Austin Singer's house, who Austin went to Trinity with me. He actually visited like the week before. Okay. So the night after prom, my mom picks me up at his house at 7 a.m. We got a flight at like 10. Uh, I think the flight might have been at like noon and my mom picks me up. We're Jews. We go to the airport early. <laughs> So, so I, I can agree with that. She picks me up. We uh, we get to San Antonio. Never been beautiful. Whatever. I sleep from like four p.m. all the way to the next morning. I can I can assume you know you can assume why. And then I uh, went to Trinity the next morning and met Zach Fragosi outside uh, the athletic center and took me to the tour and I just felt so comfortable there. There was no, it was the only opportunity for me to play, but I knew that that was the decision I was going to make. If I could get into the school, I had a meeting with the like administration office later that day uh, to do some, I guess, haggling. And then uh, I got admitted and I went and that was it. And I'm, and I'm unbelievably grateful for that. That's great. No, that's good. And you got to, when you, you just know when you get on campus, if that's the, the feeling, you know, if you, you feel, it feels right when you go there. Yeah. Um, do you think if you would have gone to a bigger school, maybe your draft position would have changed or you would have had the same success or even more success? I mean, I know it's a hypothetical, but what are your thoughts on, because you played at a small school, do you obviously, do you think it hindered your draft ability? I got drafted in the 31st round. Yeah. And I got, and I was able to play summer ball, like in the coastal plains league, which is like top five league. And then the NECBL, which is like a top five league. Right. My sophomore and junior summers and I played well. And I think that plus playing well during the season, I think the Mets gave me a chance and who knows if I would have been drafted after that, but I, I don't know. It's a really tough question because I think when you pick a school, what comes with that is the opportunities that your coach can present to you and the opportunities that you create for yourself. And so because I played freshman year, I was the only freshman that played in a, uh, in a class of seniors. The entire starting lineup was seniors and then me, an 18-year-old kid from Phoenix. And they're like, we're going to win a national championship this year. Jeremy, either you keep up or you don't. And I, I don't know. I think I hit. Actually, I need to go back and look at those, scout, those reports because I, I don't remember where I hit. I don't remember that at all it feels like such a long time ago but like yeah. those experiences of like playing right away not having to worry about scholarship and just focusing on my performance that that was the most valuable thing i could have ever asked for and it's like year after year after year after year the ability to just be able to focus solely on playing baseball i think because of those opportunities just give me have me give me the ability to like perform and grow as a baseball player and right. gave me the opportunity to get drafted. Yeah. Hey, you can't ask for anything else than that. Um, and like, like I uh, mentioned earlier, you guys did win a national championship. So that is really cool that you got to be a part of that. Um, so you went in the 31st round, like you said, and now you're in the, the Mets minor league system. That was kind of your first, you know, look into what would be kind of a foreshadowing into what you're doing now. But what do you remember about the early parts of your professional career and just the transition from college to minor league baseball? I got, I'll, I'll, I'll reset the story because there's so many different pieces to like that draft week, right? Uh, the national championship was on like May, I think like 26th or 27th. The draft is like June 6th or 7th. And so we're in Appleton, Wisconsin uh, for the World Series. I get a phone call. Uh, hey, Jeremy, come down to uh, St. Lucie, Florida. We'd love to do a tryout with you on this date. I booked the ticket. It's two days after the national championship. So I knew I'd be back in San Antonio by then. We won the national championship. Uh, we, I fly home. I picked up whatever gear I needed. I flew to Tampa. My buddy picked me up in Tampa. 
I, I slept four hours that night. We then drove to St. Lucie, did a tryout, fucking killed it. Like the, <laughs> like honestly, the best I ever felt on a baseball field was at the tryout at the New York Mets. And I grew up a diehard Mets fan. So to get wow. that call to be there, to be on the field, my arm had never felt better. I'm taking BP and, and JP Ricciardi looks at me and he goes, don't take another round. And I'm like, Hold, like holy shit. Okay. Thank yeah. you, JP. Whatever. Awesome. Awesome experience. Fly home. Day one of the draft. I go, like, okay, okay. Obviously not day one. Day two of the draft. Probably not day two. Day three, I'm like freaking out. Am I going to get drafted today? What do I do if I don't get drafted? Do I go play indie ball? I don't want to go play indie ball. Do I get a job? I need to make a resume. I need to do all this. Uh, I go out to lunch with some friends and my dad and I get a text from my friend, a good friend of mine named Bradley. And Brad goes, hey, congratulations. And I was like, what, what do you mean, congratulate? Like on the national championship? Thanks so much. Like we just won. I got some of the guys here. It's yeah, pretty yeah. great. And uh, he goes, no, 31st round with the Mets. And I call him. He goes, yeah, I just turned it on the ticker. My phone blows up. I get a call 10 minutes later. I'm crying. My dad is there. My mom came in. And I'm sure you look back on your time and go, that was sure. the best moment of my entire life. Getting drafted, yeah. getting the phone call from, I forgot who called me. It wasn't the GM. Maybe it was a scout that signed you or something like that. I don't know or... if it was the scout, but, and it wasn't, it was one of the front office guys. And uh, congratulations, Jeremy. We just picked you up in the 31st round. Uh, I'm like, thank you so much. Like, this is a dream come true. Like, uh, I'm sure he gets that every single time he makes that phone call. He goes, we're going to give you $5,000. Is that okay? And I go, yeah, I mean, sure. I'll, <laughs> I'll come for a Target gift card. Like, I don't yeah. care. I'll go. Yeah. Right. Uh, I walk into the facility uh, the first day. I think I flew out the next day. I go to the facility. Wolf is on the top of the thing. My jersey, Wolf, like number 46. I don't know, spring training, whatever. And Zach Wheeler walks by. Hey, buddy, congratulations. I'll see you in the big leagues. Walks back into the kitchen. I go, holy shit, I'm here. I'm here, I did it. All of that hard work, everything for that moment right there. And honestly, like, it's such a world when I look back on it. My time in professional baseball was so quick. I've been doing more than baseball longer than I was a minor league baseball player. Yeah. And so I look back and I think about what I learned in those really quick, it was like 18 months from like getting drafted to getting hurt. And uh, unbelievably grateful, unbelievably honored for the opportunity to do that, to live out a dream. Um, and, and I'm so fond of my time doing it. And it was so valuable for me as a baseball player and as a person that I just more than baseball is just my excuse to help out my friends who are still doing it and to just make it easier for guys. It's so hard. Yeah. Can we provide opportunities for, to make it easier for guys? Yes. Yes. Right. We can. Well, I mean, yeah, you guys are at the forefront of that. Um, before we get to that, I just, I, so let's find, you know, I wanted to kind of have you tell the story of kind of how you phased out of baseball. So you had a back surgery. How did, what actually happened there and what went into all that? And then ultimately you got released. So what was that whole process there? Kingsport, I got drafted, went to Kingsport, rookie ball, short season, the Happy League. Rest in peace. And uh, I slid into second base wrong. It felt, it just felt bad. And I just, I knew something was right, wasn't right, but I played through it because it, I'm like two months into my professional career. Right. And yeah. I think nothing of it. And I, I, I think I'm sitting at like 195 now. I was 220, 225 at the time. So I'm carrying an extra 30 pounds on a frame that probably shouldn't have had it. Yeah. Uh, I'm 6'2. I'm average tall. You can find my podcast. Average yeah, yeah. tall. A tall, tall Jews podcast, I guess. Uh, and so I think I thought of it. I get home. I drive from, from Tennessee to back to Phoenix. And like the day or two after I drove, like things are tight. Like things don't feel good. I go get an MRI, herniated disc, like six millimeters. A lot of people have that issue. So I said, okay, give me a, like a little epidural uh, and let me rehab. So I rehabbed. I get to spring training next season, my first spring training. And I had sciatic pain like you'd never felt before. Um, like unbearable pain. I felt it in my toes every single step I took. I knew at one point it was going to be much worse, but there's nothing I could do. I didn't want to go to my first spring training and be like on the DL or in the training room. I just played through it. Right. All of that pain. There was nothing I could do to make my body feel better. I felt horrible. I, 
I I'm in spring training. Tim Tebow is there. Nice. Uh, he was like he's like my locker mate actually. Oh wow. Uh, so I was like, you're going to Columbia. So I'm I go back. I go to extended, right? I'm extended for three months, and uh, it just it started to feel better. And then when I got to Brooklyn, like it felt it was fine, bearable. Uh, played through that season. Uh, I think I played it pretty much every other day or whatever. I wasn't yeah I to fill a spot like that was just my role and um this is about august middle of august i go to uh, forgot who we're playing but we're in brooklyn and my grandpa is actually there my family's from new york city so my grandpa and my uncle were there and i'm in pregame you know i'm running in pregame and then i turn to my right and uh it popped thing pops uh i can feel liquid running down my leg i can feel my back oh. tighten up my stomach like shrank it like i couldn't stand up straight and so i'm like at second base you know like behind the second base bag like standing there like fuck my career's over the game's gonna start in five minutes i cannot pick up my foot i'm gonna have to suffer through this or take myself out of the game and i go fuck it like i can't run but i'm not gonna take myself out of the game i'm gonna go <laughs> i'm gonna do that one inning and then i'm gonna walk in and that's my career Writing was probably on the wall for me to get released anyway, but I was like, I'm done. I need one more inning for me and I'm done. So I get back in the dugout. I look at Quinn, who's the center fielder. I go, Hey, I can't move. I'm going to go out and play left field for one inning. If anything comes my way, you're going to have to go get it down. He goes down the line. I go, yeah, like I'm not moving. <laughs> I'm going to walk out there. I'm going to do an inning. We're going to play catch two or three times and I'm going to walk back in the dugout. And I'm probably never, I literally said this. I'm like, I'm never going to play again. So I got to the outfield. I'm crying the entire time. All my, my career uh, is up to this. There's 10,000 people at the ballpark. My grandpa's sitting right behind the first base dugout. And I'm just sobbing because I knew that my career was over. I knew this is my last time on a baseball field. Nothing comes to me. Thank God. I, I jogged to second base. I can't even get from second base to home. Trey Cobb and Marcel Renteria, who are still playing with the Mets, I think they're in double A right now, uh, carry me down the steps and help carry me into the locker room, which is like up the steps uh, back in. And I'm, the entire time I'm like fucking crying. Number one, I'm never going to play baseball again. I'm looking at the field like I'm never going to do this again. Number two, I can't feel my legs. I get back in the thing. I had so much adrenaline and so much anger. I broke every single one of my bats. And I went into the training and he's like, you have a herniated disc. I go, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> no shit, G Gio. I, I love him. Gio yeah. Dianza. Uh, I go, no shit, dude. Like, I'm done. Do something. Help me with something. I can't move. I can't feel my legs. Help me. He's like, there's nothing I can do right now. The swelling's too bad. I go, can you put me on a bus back to the, the hotel? So we got an intern to take him back to the hotel. I didn't get out of bed for three days. The team went on a road trip, so I didn't have any medical attention. I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep the entire time. I actually tickled, I didn't go to the bathroom and I didn't eat. So much pain. I had nobody to call, nobody to talk to, nobody who could help support me other than the intern that lived the floor below me in the hotel that they put us up in who had to literally had the key. I'd order Uber Eats. He would uh, go to my room, open it up, leave the food in there. And I was just like, thank you. Like, there's nothing I can do. So unbearable pain. Uh, I went out, you know, get the surgery a few weeks later. Uh, they, <laughs> the hotel, I'm telling the whole story. We're going deep. Yeah, this is. Uh, deep. They fly me from, from, you know, home, you know, New York City to home. Actually, the night before, they put me in a hotel room overlooking City Field. It's like, uh, hey, you could have been there. <laughs> That's what I remember. I woke up the night of my, the day of my flight you know, back surgery two days before and I'm looking right at City Field. And I'm like, God, oh, shit, that could have been, you know, that would have been fun. That was a fun ride. Uh, I get home and uh, I get released in October. So I got home like September 3rd or 4th. I get released in October before I could walk yet after my surgery. And I go, this is not good. Like, number one, am I, is that allowed that I couldn't kind of either rehab with the team or get my job back or whatever. They said, Hey, thanks for the opportunity. You know, thank you for uh, your service to the Mets. Uh, we're going to have to release you. And I go, okay, thank you for the opportunity. And then he hung up. That was it. I got 20 weeks of physical therapy, 20 sessions of physical therapy. 
made them send me to the expensive one. And, um, and that was it. 20 sessions of physical therapy. And then I was on my own. And I was like, there needs to be, there needs to be support. There needs to be someone for me to call. I had a college degree. I could build a resume. Fine. I can transition into something other than playing baseball. But what about the guys that can't? And though, so the wheels started turning on more than baseball and the value of building a system of support based on my experiences of not having anybody to go to. And I knew other guys were going to feel that way. And I knew other guys had over the years, there's just been nothing for them to go to. And more than baseball is that, is that response. So that's, that's my, my minor league baseball experience. Unbelievably honored, but just surprised and shocked that the support system wasn't there. So we built something that helps guys. That's, that's a crazy story, man. I mean, you would think, uh, not to dwell on this, but you would think after you get hurt, like you're supposed to rehab with the team, at least, not that, well, who knows what your job status would have been after, but at least get you back to walking physically able to do things. And they so just, maybe, yeah. Maybe during season. Yeah. Uh, but after the season, they sent me home and that yeah. was it. And uh, I, I, I look back and go, you know, was there grounds for a lawsuit or any of that? It, it never crossed my mind. Yeah. But now that I know about number one, minor league baseball employment and like the, the, the rights that, that they're given. Um, but also the rights of just like people. <laughs> yeah. I, and now that I know more about that, I'm more educated on like what is right and wrong. And I didn't know right and wrong at the time. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you had the back surgery. You obviously came back to being able to play. And so uh, explain to me how you were able to get in touch with the Team Israel and all that stuff where you were actually, you know, going to be playing and you didn't even know you're going to be playing. So myself, in my class, myself, Simon Rosenbaum of Pomona Pitzer, who's also a very too tall Jew. He's like <laughs> six. He's like six, seven. And uh, Jake Fishman, who played Division Three, I forgot where, but he was an outfielder and he was a pitcher. And we were all Jewish All Americans in the Jewish Baseball News magazine okay. or whatever. These two yeah, guys yeah. that make these lists every year that somehow they knew I was Jewish. I know it was never mitzvahed. They must have seen a photo. Yeah, they must have known that I was in Scottsdale or whatever. Uh, they must have known I was a Mets fan. All these qualifications, right. and so. Uh, there was uh, some understanding of like who the Jews were in, in baseball. And so, you know, I played with the Mets and I was done playing. I was in San Antonio at the time where, you know, I, I went back to Trinity uh, and uh, tried to coach a little bit, but uh, got a job that actually paid me money. Uh, I ran a gym for two years in San Antonio and, nice. and I started more than baseball at the time. And I said, uh, I called team Israel and I was like, Hey, I run this nonprofit. we, help minor league baseball players. And we also uh, help distribute equipment and uh, build fields internationally. And uh, he goes, do you want to play outfield on the Olympic team? And I said, yes, <laughs> this is Peter Kurz. Right. So Peter sends me to Israel, uh, sends me to Israel, January, 2019. I get my passport. I go on birthright four months later. I, I've had the, I had the most unbelievable time when I was in Israel. The team, uh, we had our first tournament, I guess, in like July of that year did the two week tournament in Bulgaria, um, came back to San Antonio, just was like sitting on my couch one day, like I'm going to move to Israel. So we went to Lithuania. We did like the next part of the tournament in Lithuania. We went back to San Antonio. I drove my car back home. I packed up all my things. I brought everything with me to Germany. And then from Germany where we had like, where we qualified for the Olympics, all the, the entire team came back to the States except for me and Peter and Kaz, who's the best, and a couple coaches. And we went back to Israel and I got an apartment with a friend of mine who I went on birthright with and we lived in Tel Aviv for the next six months as, as, an, Olympi- as an Olympian. <laughs> and I was like, I need to, I need to, for me, it was like, I need to understand like who I'm, who I'm representing. And given the passport, Israel helped set me up and uh, the rest is history, but it was 
the opportunity to play for Team Israel presented itself in a way that I just you know, wanted to take advantage of it as as much as possible, and uh, it's been a life changing, uh, life altering experience for sure. And I I did birthright as well. It was an awesome experience. I did it back in 2013, but in 2012 I played for the qualifier for Team Israel that was still in Florida, so I never got to go there and play or or uh, I guess outside of um, the United States to play for Team Israel. But you guys did. And you guys qualified for the Olympics, which is pretty awesome. It was supposed to be in 2020. So just to fill us in, this summer, as they, re, as they bring back the Olympics, what is the plan for the uh, baseball Olympics and with Team Israel? Right now of our roster, I think there's around 30 or so guys. Uh, there are some guys that are playing double A, triple A. Uh, they're, they're with their team or they're with their affiliate and can come to the Olympics when like it's time to go to the Olympics. Um, the rest of us are preparing on our own. We're going to play indie ball. So myself and Rob Poller are going to play with the Lake Erie Crushers from, you know, Team Israel comes to Phoenix next week. The guys who are able to, you know, Shlomo will be here. Um, Alex Katz is with his season, but like Alon Leishman will be here. Um, Tal Lorel will be here. Danny Valencia and Ian Kinsler are on the roster. They're going to be here. Former big leaguers, yeah. Former big leaguers. So we're going to have, like, the team here do a few events, practice, be together as a team. Joey Wagman's back in, uh, you know, so- somewhere in Europe, like yeah. the Czech Republic. And so uh, we're going to have a group of guys here. And then the guys are going to go off, play professionally, or just get ready on their own. New York City, like, July 7th or so, we're going to start, like, 10 days of exhibitions. And then the team, the roster guys, will fly out to Tokyo uh, and – play Olympic baseball, which is something that we all thought was possible. The Jews who we connected with, you know, who followed us thought it was possible. We had a good enough team. No one in the entire world thought that we could win that qualifier. And we did. And that looking back on it, it's just the most amazing kind of two weeks of baseball I've ever experienced. And I, and I didn't even get to go overseas and play in anything like that, but just the, the 10 t- days to two weeks that I had doing it, y- you, it was for the first time in your professional career, you're not playing for yourself. Yep. It was just, you're playing for another country, which is like a totally different feeling. And it felt like the winning came back or like that mentality of like, oh, we don't care who gets the credit. We just want to win and qualify. You know, playing college baseball, you have this like sense of teamwork. You're with the guys for four years. You live together. You have these experiences together we won a national championship and I've, I've, and I've won two state championships in high school. Like I've been part of winning teams before. Yeah. Um, playing professionally. It's such a shock when you go from college baseball to professional baseball, because it's all about you. What can I do to make it to the next level? How can I make that paycheck? This I'm in it for me. I don't really care about my teammate. Right. Why would I care about him? He's going to take my spot. Right. Why do I care about the coach. I care about the coach because he's going to either get me up to the next level or he's going to get me released. And so there's like the politics and the, the I, I, I of professional baseball. Winning didn't matter. No. But when you play international baseball and when you play in Olympic baseball, it just like there's another gear. Another gear gets flipped that you never thought that you had. It's the, I don't care about my stats. I'm going to do anything I can to win this ball game because we have the opportunity to go to the Olympics and that's all that matters. And so with Team Israel, I am... With, with Trinity, I was, I was three-hole hitter. I did all the things I needed to do. In, in professional baseball, I was the small fish in this gigantic ocean. And with Team Israel, I finally felt like I had a role again. Yeah. Played outfield, hit, you know, seventh or eighth or ninth. There were guys there, Blake Galen and uh, Nick Rickles and Valencia were there. And Ty Kelly was there. And it was just awesome to be on a field with guys that I watched growing up. Danny Valencia. Certainly Ian Kinsel was my favorite player growing up. So like to have, to now have these experiences with guys that I can now learn so much from or just be around or uh, just shoot the shit with. Um, it's just a culmination of like everything that I've wanted in a baseball career. So I never made it to the big leagues, but uh, I could not be happier with like <laughs> how things, yeah. how things have turned out. Yeah. You got to play for something much bigger, which is great. So we'll definitely be, I'll definitely be watching you guys this summer in the Olympic. That's pretty awesome. But I want to get to the, the big topic that, uh, that you are a part of, which is more than baseball. So you're the executive director and your colleague and, and a former first round pick of the Yankees, Slade Heathcott, is working with you on this. Explain what more than baseball is. I know we kind of touched on it, but what are the goals of the organization and you know, what is it, uh, what do you guys do for 
players. Yeah. Uh, so Slade and I first connected in 2018, the Save America's Pastime Act had just come out. It's this bill that um, Major League Baseball had lobbied for, for about a year or two to get like basically shoved into the back of a bill just to be passed. What it does, uh, they spent around $6 million lobbying Congress to do this. And what it does is it solidifies the fact, the antitrust exemption that minor league baseball players have. Uh, minor leaguers, according to the Save America's Pastime Act, are now seasonal apprentices who are not afforded overtime or minimum wage under the law. And so I knew a little bit of this, and I knew that my next year in professional baseball was going to have a GoPro, and I was going to like kind of track my journey and uh, kind of show, showcase a little bit about what was happening. The fact that I asked, you know, hey, you know, can you guys help me get a case of bats? And they say, no, you do that on your own. I go, I can't afford that. I got $500 a month in student loan bills and I make $45 a game. I made around $3,000 my both of my years playing. I can't afford $500 a month in bats. They're like, it's nothing we can do. And so seeing the environment of minor league baseball, I knew that obviously more than a documentary was going to, you know, going to be needed here. I got released. Yeah. So I actually couldn't go do that. And so I was back in San Antonio. I was working. Save America's Pastime Act comes out and I was so fucking mad i go we have to do something the idea for more than baseball came right when i read it this is more than like this is more than baseball oh shit that's the name of the organization what are we going to do we're going to help provide opportunities for minor league baseball players where they don't already have them where they need them right so i started tweeting about it from the more than baseball twitter account that i had just made and i said hey like we're starting this organization we we are starting this organization that's going to help minor league baseball players navigate the journey of being a minor league baseball player, help them getting access to affordable housing, food, and equipment. Slade, I see that you're tweeting about minor league baseball. Let's have a conversation about this soon. He said, yes. He goes, reach out to David Cohn, who used to run the, uh, the union uh, for the American League. And it was American League rep and uh, is a current Yankees uh, broadcaster. Yeah, former pitcher. You're talking about David Cohn. Former pitcher, yeah. former Cy, Cy Young maybe, but through yeah. a perfect game. Yeah. And uh, to, uh, DM'd him. The next day I'm on the phone with David Cohn. He goes, this is a great idea. Keep me in the loop. We talked for about an hour on like the steps that need to be taken to provide legitimacy. Right. Slade was still playing, still talking about the issues of minor league baseball and why it sucks the environment is not conducive to success and development at the minor league level. He gets released. <laughs> he gets blackballed. Uh, he, there's no reason a first round pick who was hitting, I think 280 or 290 at the time in triple a gets released and doesn't get picked up. So he goes and plays indie ball. Um, and kind of was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go home. I have a kid. I, I want to be with my family. Uh, things start to cool down a little bit. This is mid 2018. He goes, well, let's do this. And two and a half, three years after that, we brought on Simon Rosenbaum Larson, who's another co-founder of ours. He's a current minor leaguer with the Rays, junior draft pick out of Harvard, smart as hell, committed and devoted as hell. One of the, the best people I've ever had the opportunity to work with because he's so passionate and having former first round pick 30 for 31st round pick who lived the grind and uh, 19th round current player basically working on more than baseball day in and day out for three years we've just opened up doors that weren't possible before there are other groups now adopt a minor leaguer and minor league advocates that we all work together to ensure that minor league baseball players have these things at their disposal that are going to help them during and right. after their career right we when we have conversations with major league baseball and the teams and the pa and uh front offices and However, we say we are a tool for player development because we are allowing players the opportunity to focus on their performance and their recovery and their development. Getting them a mattress is going to help them sleep better. If they sleep better. They will perform better. If you make it easier for them to find housing, if you give them education, if you help teach them English, if you give them opportunities for independent mental health coaching, you're going to have better athletes. And if you have better athletes, you're going to have a better minor league system. And people go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, that's it. It's that easy. Is that easy? And so we, we say, if you see us on social media and we do what we do because we just love baseball. We want it to be a more welcoming and better place. 
uh, that's made us incredibly successful. We don't scream from the rooftops. We put things in motion and we take action uh, for the things that we believe in. And that is why we are in this position. And that's why three years later, we're still doing it. Right. So a lot, a lot of great stuff. I mean, everything you're saying, of course, is true. It's common sense. Every, you know, minor leaguers get treated like shit. That's just the bottom line. Now, what <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess I have a couple questions for you. One is, the, uh, I'll ask you a couple. Does MLB care enough? Does Major League Baseball care enough about the minor leagues or just the best, the cream of the crop will rise and that's it? Or, and also what kind of solutions like, in my opinion, when people ask me about what should Major League Baseball do for minor leaguers, I say at least pay for housing. Why not have like a dorm or a, a apartment set up for all the players at home? And, you know, so it makes it easier. So they don't have to worry about paying for housing and rent and all that stuff. When you think about all of that, what should Major League Baseball do? They should bring more than baseball in as the official nonprofit supporting minor league baseball players. Because we're good for the game. We help engage local communities. We're supporting communities that they cut minor league baseball teams from. We're helping players transition out of playing. We're helping finding them education, quality education uh, during and after their career. We're doing the things that the teams aren't. Right. And, and, and they're not going to. They don't care what the guys do off the field. They don't care what the guys do when they get released, but they care about these guys now because these guys are tools that can be used at the big league level to extend and create championship windows. So what can you do when they're in rookie ball? What can you do when they're in A or double A or triple A? What can you do to support them to help make them better baseball players? If the system itself is set up to be able to focus on on, and develop talent fairly and equally and not based just on merit or signing bonus, but when the entire organization itself is pushed forward by increased development, you're going to have better ball players come from it. The big leagues is not just made up of, of first and second round picks. Right. A, a majority of it is. I think around 40 to 50%. I think, 50, I think around 50 or 60% is like first, second, third round picks understandably right but an entire roster of uh on the on a, on a major league field uh you're gonna need low round guys you're gonna need the 10th through 20th rounds you're gonna need 20th to 40th rounds that they just cut you're gonna need these guys pushing each other forward and if you have too many guys who are too good trade them away and create an extend championship window so for us when we think as like this nonprofit that helps baseball players, that helps them focus and helps them develop. All we see ourselves is, is like, how can we help this guy play better? Because if he hits, if he gets another three hits, the difference between hitting 250 and 300 is three hits. And the difference between making it to the big leagues and not can be, the, it can be throwing a 94 mile per hour fastball and a 96 mile per hour fastball. And so when I look at the big leagues now and I see Kevin Pilar, who was the 31st round, was actually my same pick. And I see Kevin Kiermeyer. Yeah. And I see uh, Orlando Hudson, who was a 40th round pick. And I see John Smoltz, who was a late round guy. And I see Hall of Famers and, and big leaguers come from these later rounds. They're drafted because they have value and potential and creating a system that enables them to develop properly, not based on their amount of their signing bonus is how I feel, feel strong about this. I forgot who said it. I think it was Bill Polian who was a GM of the Indianapolis Colts. And he said this before the draft last week. And he said, uh, you win games in the NFL with first through third round picks. You win Super Bowls with third through sixth round picks. You win World Series with an entire organization uh, pushing each other forward where competition is deep. When you look at the best farm systems, you're looking at teams that are consistently in the playoffs and winning championships. Cardinals, Dodgers, Astros, uh, I can throw in the Blue Jays now and the Rays, and a, and, a, and a handful of other teams all focus as a lot on their minor leaguers, but there's still so much to go. Yeah, and we are that that component that is that so much to go. Part. Right. No, I totally agree with that. Um, as far as uh, America's pastime being baseball, and it's kind of gotten passed over, you know, obviously by, NF by the NFL and NBA and stuff like that. 
Is it fixable, you think, for baseball to come back into the limelight as a glamour sport again? Or is it possible? How are they going to fix this to bring baseball back to being America's pastime? It's good marketing, right? Saying that baseball is America's pastime and we can look and say, is it still America's pastime? The average age of a Major League Baseball fan is 55 years old. Right. If I have, if I don't have cable, I cannot watch my hometown team. I have a, I have MLB TV, which is a fantastic service, by the way. Yeah. But I live in Phoenix, so I cannot watch the Diamondbacks and I cannot watch who the Diamondbacks are playing. So I got a VPN and I pay $10 a month and my phone thinks I'm in Canada <laughs> and I watch the Diamondbacks. There you go. And the inaccessibility to baseball is hurting the game. The inability for a, a fan or a kid to have an Instagram page that posts highlights, much like House of Hoops or much like Highlight Heaven on Instagram that, that promote the NFL, and promote MLB, they're not allowed to do that for baseball because baseball wants to own every ounce of, of footage. And so you're making it less accessible for me to watch my hometown team in a right. sport that's unbelievably regional. And you're making it less accessible for me to, as a kid, access cool baseball things on Instagram. If I see basketball and football more, I'm going to be a basketball and football fan more. Right. But if I'm a kid now, and if I have an Xbox before last week or whatever, I couldn't get the show. Yeah. So you're splitting up half of the fan base. And if you have a PS4, you can play the baseball video game. But if you have Xbox, so you're already segmenting a population that you're trying to target. And so I look at where Major League Baseball is now. And I look at where it can be. And I see that Major League Baseball just cut 42 minor league franchises. I see now that there's 40, there's 20 less rounds in the draft. So there's less accessibility to play professional baseball. And I know at the college baseball level, there's 12 scholarships for a Division One team, and I think 12 or 13 on the Division Two team. Division Three, no scholarship. I yeah, I still pay that every month. Right. So if I'm a kid, I'm gonna. I love Steph. I love LeBron. Oh my God! Look at what Odell did. Look at Juju. He's playing video games and he's scoring touchdowns. But then I look at the personalities in baseball and I go Lindor and Stroman. And that Mike Trout guy's really good when in fact he's the best player ever, but nobody watches him because he plays for the angels. Right. And I look, I like Harper, but I don't know personalities in baseball because right. everything's so regional and I can't watch it on my phone because MLB won't let me. And so if I'm a baseball player and I go to college, well, uh, why would I, and I play, I want to play two sports. I want to pick a sport. Well, I'm going to go somewhere where I can get a full ride scholarship. So I'm going to pick football. I'm going to pick basketball rather than picking baseball. And if you look at what Kyler Murray did, that was bad for baseball. First round pick goes, I'm going to go play football because I'm going to have 30 million guaranteed. I'm going to make 70 million in endorsements. And the next five years, I'm going to be worth hundred million. Or if I go play baseball, I'm going to make $55 a game. And play in the minors for five and play years. In the minors for four <laughs> years. Oh, by the way, then I got to get arbitration. And oh, by the way, I got to play another two years of my arbitration contract and then get a full deal and oh, there's no veteran uh, contract anymore. And so my career earnings went from 100 million in the NFL in five years to 20 years in Major League Baseball. And I maybe made 50 or 60 if I had a good career. Right. And so you look at all of these factors. I look at all yes. these factors on a daily basis and I go, what, what are we going to do? Yeah. Right. How do we make baseball more accessible for fans? More than baseball, we are in the space of, we are, in, we are on Twitch. <laughs> We're bringing minor leaguers to kids on Twitch. We, we talk to kids all the time on social media. We do MLB minis. We do all of the things that make kids excited about baseball. And we're just doing what we can to make baseball more enticing and exciting for kids to play, giving guys opportunities, helping give scholarships to really good players, helping uh, bring equipment to communities that need it. Uh, that's what's going to push the game forward. But you got a lot of a lot of work going on. I, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you mentioned about the MLB cutting a bunch of minor league teams and stuff. And I don't think people realize like those are those small towns that need those teams, right? Those stadiums, those people have jobs and, you know, it's something to look forward to when they don't have a professional team, you know, an MLB team close by. How did the elimination of the minor league teams affect your organization and help? Did you, did it gain more traction? Were you guys helping a bunch of new minor leaguers or had like who qualifies for your program? How does it, how did that all work? Yeah. Before the pandemic, Major League Baseball already proposed to cut 42 teams. So this, so this is going to happen anyway. It was going to happen anyway. Yeah. And we knew that at that time, we had about 500 players in the organization. We're making moves. We're getting guys in. Guys are interested in the fact that they can go to us for discounts on equipment or help with housing or helping get food. Yeah. Um, and help transitioning out. COVID hits. Adam Wainwright donates a $250,000. We created the player grant program and distributed money directly to direct financial assistance to St. Louis Cardinals players. We were never designed to give money to players, but Adam Wainwright goes, I want to give this money to Cardinals minor leaguers that aren't going to make any money until there's a stipend or until next season. So we distributed the money with the Cardinals to uh, these players. Daniel Murphy donates a hundred thousand dollars. Sean Doolittle and Ryan Zimmerman and Max Scherzer and uh, the, enti- the entire Colorado Rockies pitched in. Tommy Pham pitched in and helped support the player grant program. So we were able to do a, a, a first round of player grant program. December of last year, the trust goes, we're going to give you $500,000 for two rounds of the player grant program. We're, we just unleashed number uh, the second round of that yesterday. So... In one year, we've raised close to, in the program, we've raised about a million dollars, distributed uh, much of it, a lot, unbelievable amount of money to uh, 1,500 minor league baseball players with direct financial assistance, both American, Dominican, Venezuela, and Puerto Rican. Oh, wow. Uh, Actually, guys from 14 different countries. And so what we saw from the cuts is that there were guys that were going to stay and there were guys because of those cuts were just released. So midway through the pandemic, about a thousand guys were cut. And so we're scrambling to make sure that we can bring them into the system early enough, give them a grant and make sure that they have the tools at their disposal within the program to help support them as they transition into something else or find another opportunity. When we look at who was left over, we realized that guys needed more structured support right so throughout the last year to get ready for like this season we made sure that like everything goes in place for when more cuts were going to happen we created the release player program we have office hours now they can connect directly with like our professionals we sent it to major league baseball teams and they sent it to their players to say hey we know we released you but more than baseball is here to help support you that's good so that's good and that system of support is there to it's there because I didn't have that. Remember what the fuck was I going to do after my career? Yeah. Now more than baseball is solving those problems at scale. And, uh, but you know, your question was like 42 teams are cut. Yeah. 42 communities don't have professional baseball anymore. Some of them are now college summer league teams and that's fine. They still have baseball. Fine. Johnson city and the futures league and Trenton thunder went from triple A to like this college league now. Yeah. And that's tough. But it's still not good when, when there is less baseball and less accessibility to baseball yeah. and less accessibility to high-quality baseball. From a business perspective, having less teams, having less players, having a little bit of a raise, like between 30 and 50% raise for players who are left over, which is – peanuts when you're making you know ten thousand dollars a year right all raise is a raise yeah (laughs) when when you have less players you're able to give more focus to players that are left over i hope that continues to happen uh because if not then it was all in vain and it was just just uh just a move that i don't agree with but from a business perspective to pay less players and still get the same relatively the same product that's a move that major league baseball is going to make 10 times out of 10 
I'm in, I'm here though, to make sure that like the person behind that number or behind that figure behind that Jersey has like things that he needs. Yeah. And I'm sure you saw it. I'm sure you lived it too. Oh yeah. No, definitely. I mean, when you, some of these, you know, the lower levels, it's the worst, right? There's the least amount of funding per se at those lower levels. Once you get to double A and triple A, now you, you know, at least you got better cities, better stadiums. And I mean, still, you'd only get paid six months out of the year. So, um, I last big question I want to ask you is I've heard you talk about, uh, you had a great message about the type of people you work with and passionate people and all that stuff. So I wanted to ask you about that and have you kind of relay that message again about forming this team that's uh, for more than baseball and everybody's on the same page and passionate about this. So explain to me about the types of people you want to work with. We would not have had this success. The 50 big leaders that work with us, the um, ability to do like, you know, MTB kicks, the custom cleats that we do on the field without, uh, and like to continuously like do the programs that we want to do and help these guys just because we love baseball without uh, the team that, you know, Slade and I started this and Simon started this three years ago. But since then, I think if you were to look at like our team, it's about 10 or 15 people. And, and it just happens. It was never, hey, we're hiring. It was, hey, Megan Gurton, who is a mom of three and was like, hey, I have my master's degree from the University of Texas and I really love what you guys do. And I made you a PowerPoint of all the different things that you guys can do as an organization. And I'd really love to help implement some of these ideas. And we said, Megan, you're our new program coordinator. <laughs> and for, uh, we have Max Savidra and Jonathan Perrin. Uh, Jonathan, who's a former uh, minor leaguer, who uh, is a financial advisor. And they're both financial advisors. And so they help with the financial guidance newsletter and our direct financial uh, wealth managers for, uh, for, for their profession, but also they help minor leaguers understand like what they can do with their finances. Uh, Caleb Mezzi and uh, JJ Franco uh, are both unbelievably passionate baseball people and JJ played minor league baseball and wants to help these guys understand how to leverage being a professional baseball in a job market. And so if you look at all of our programs, um, the mental health program has Zach Penprice, who's on Team Rizzo with me, who's a mental health coach. And um, Dave McIntyre, whose son, Aiden McIntyre, is a minor leaguer with the A's. Uh, he's a, he's a, one of the best uh, mental health practitioners that the U.S. Army has ever seen. And so we built this entire team of passionate baseball people who all have the understanding and the same drive to ensure that these guys have what they need day in and day out to just be better people. Because we were, I was tired of seeing guys struggle and, and I know like Megan and all of the fans, we have like 250 uh, pretty much consistent donors, about 30 donors are monthly donors. We call our bullpen. Like everybody who is in this community is as passionate about baseball as us and are doing what they can with the time and energy and the resources that they have to ensure that the mission of more than baseball comes to life. And that's just providing more opportunities to access baseball, either as a professional, or if you, if you really want to grow the game in Colombia, let's, let's raise money and let's donate equipment. And let's, what we've done is we uh, sent about a thousand dollars to the Colombian league and they made jerseys and they put the more than baseball logo on it. And it was their team, their league's Jersey. And so the resources that we bring in go to providing free youth clinics and opportunities for people to access baseball. And it takes more than just a team to do it. Our board of directors is unbelievable. Um, we call them the beasts because they just get like so much done. Like our conversations with them are unbelievable. Um, and our translators, our group of translators, we have about five translators. If we give them a phone call, hey, we have this event coming up in three days, would you be able to be on? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'd love to. They translate the entire thing. That's uh, we have awesome. so many volunteers. We have so many people that it takes a community and a family to get the things done that we need to get done. And because we talk about baseball this way, people are open and, and welcome to 
um, share their ideas and work with us if that's something they want to do. And it's been uh, an overwhelmingly awesome thing to see over the last few years. Of just oh, it's, yeah, it's great. It's a, you yeah. guys are doing is awesome. Um, Ed, I mean, before I let you plug all your stuff, um, is there anything kind of on the horizon for more than baseball that we should look out for or, you know, new stuff that's happening with you guys or are you just continuing to fight the good fight? <laughs> uh, so fun. Yeah, it's a good fight. I, uh, just keep track on social media. We have the grant program coming out this week. It's minor league baseball players who were signed to a minor league contract as of January 1st. Um, there are different events that we're going to do around the country with minor league affiliates. Omaha, uh, my indie ball team, actually Lake Erie, we're going to do like an MTB night at the ballpark. Uh, the Rocket City Trash Pandas, which are double A for the Angels. Um, we're going to do some stuff with them. Uh, there's so many different youth clinics and opportunities that we have. Uh, coming up to like meet players, work with players, have the kids meet and work with players. Uh, if you go on our website, we have uh, what we're building now is what we call uh, experiences. So, uh, you know, a donation to more than baseball gives you an opportunity to, um, you know, do a cooking lesson over Zoom with me or play video games with Slade Heathcott or uh, have different opportunities to meet baseball players, you know, just have experiences that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. And so we're just trying to be creative with sort of what we're trying to do and just be unique and just show that like there are 3000 minor leaguers in our system. All 3000 of those guys pretty much need uh, help with one thing or another. And if you're a baseball fan, there are an unbelievable amount of different ways that you can, you can support. If you want to go baseball internationally, if you want to go locally, if you want to go to an event, if you want to host an event, if you want to host a clinic, if you want to participate on Twitch, if you want to play poker with some minor leaguers online, uh, we do that because it's fun to connect and it's the right thing to do to connect minor league baseball players to, um, to the fans. people that are helping them. Yeah. The people that are helping and just people who are baseball fans, because if we can do that on our micro level at basically our grassroots level, and we can engage a 15 year old kid and his team to do a camp, to do a showcase that we put on, to do, uh, to go follow us on Twitch, to know that his little league might be, you know, showcased on our social media. Uh, we're just going to engage a younger fan base to kind of participate with some of the stuff that we're doing. And hopefully um, that creates more lifelong baseball fans because of it, because of these opportunities that we're creating. So there's so many opportunities that more than baseball is just has that is going to make baseball a more welcoming and better place, both yeah. for minor leaguers, both for Americans and, and Venezuelans and Dominicans, but also uh, doing the stuff that we've done with Team Israel. What are some things that we can do to grow Israel, Israeli baseball? Yeah. Or uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's from Micronesia. And he's like, we got five baseball fields. Do you want to help bring equipment over there? And I said, yeah, who's going to pay for shipping? He goes, I run a nonprofit that brings crates of of goods from america to micronesia let's just make baseball crates i go that's a great idea let's bring baseball equipment to micronesia there you go so now baseball fans in louisville and omaha and myrtle beach are going to be able to bring extra equipment and school supplies we're going to be able to bring that to micronesia who who would have thought right but look what we can do yeah as a community to make this game a better place I have the best job in the world. So Israel needs some more fields, by the way, I think, right? There's two. <laughs> there's two in the whole country. There's right now there's two. Well, there's three. Okay. So Alon Leishman's kibbutz has one. Kibbutz Gezer. I know Alon. Yeah. One. Yeah. Uh, his dad built it, I guess, back in the oh, 70s. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's the one in Tel Aviv. It's very bad field. Yeah. It's the grass is long. It's uh, in the middle of the sport tech park. It's uh there's a little bit of dirt. It's there's a backstop. It's a field, but it's not a good field. Okay. It's a bad representation of baseball. Then right. there's one outside of town in uh, Pedek Tikva, and it's on a like a American Christian missionary, and that's like the main field in Israel. But two are going up right now outside of Jerusalem in Beersheba, and in Renana, which is outside of Tel Aviv. So there's about to be four or five baseball fields. Nice. Can we get them access to equipment? Can we get them access to consistent coaching? Can more than baseball raise enough money to bring a team of minor league baseball players out there? And can we do barnstorming tours of Israel? 
can we, uh, we had a conversation with some people in the UAE and they wanted to do like a, they do a sister series every year with um, the team from Tel Aviv. And can we do some things in the EAE at their, at their baseball fields? There's a lot of Americans out there. They build baseball fields. And so what, what can we do to build baseball in the Middle East, right? What can we do to build baseball in Bhutan? Bhutan has baseball. It's like in the middle of the Himalayas, they, they love baseball. And we work at the organization that um, we're helping bring equipment and help grow baseball over there and help bring education as part of it. And so you asked earlier, is baseball the national pastime? What can we do to make it the national pastime? I, I don't know if we, if we need to, right? I think the, where baseball is, maybe the smaller amount of people that are more passionate about it than, than they were before might be able to get more done. And I'm in the space 24 seven, but I don't know if basketball has that same, it's a global game, but I don't know if it has that same global cachet that baseball can have in this sort of way. Football, certainly not. Yeah. Too many rules. If you're not in America, you don't understand football. Right, right. And so as a, as a, if we want to help people, baseball seems to be the best opportunity to do that. And uh, to, we're in that position to do that. Yeah, help mind the leaguers. That's, that's our goal. But like, there's so much more that goes into it than, than just that. Right. What, uh, where can everybody follow you guys or donate if they want to check out, you know, everything you guys are doing for more than baseball on like online and social media. Yeah. Uh, more than baseball.org is our website. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter at MTB underscore O R G. Uh, I'm pretty active on link- LinkedIn. Um, uh, people love it. I, I, I post about it and great. a lot of people are engaging on it. So I, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow our, our podcast is called the grind. So on social media, the grind underscore pod. Uh, and then on our YouTube channel, we post, uh, clips from our podcast and then different things that we're doing. Um, and we're just trying to make it fun and exciting to love and watch baseball again. So, uh, if you want to donate, like, I'm honestly, so thankful for the opportunity to, you know, for, to do that. Um, but if you want to host an event, if you want to host a player, um, if you want to do one of our experiences, uh, follow the newsletter and stay up to date and follow social media because uh, we're having a we're having a lot of fun. And so um, we'd love to have as many people as possible come with us. Definitely, man. I, I want to be, you know, do something, do my part as well. So um, the whole minor league stuff hits home for me. I, I'm, I'm with you, man. Um, this felt like it's part of this felt like an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm or Seinfeld or something, you know, so it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you was talking? Yes, real quick. Actually, I have to get this on camera. I actually, yeah. I, I already saw it, the joke, but your mom is Italian, right? Yes. And your dad is uh, is Jewish. So yes. I think you said something about matzo balls over meatballs, right? <laughs> well, well, I don't know. My, my, my mother's Italian. We grew up every Sunday doing Sunday pasta, okay. meatballs and spaghetti and whatever. Yeah. But then on... Uh, during the week, it'd be Jewish food because we go to Jew- like I had both. I grew up with both. Yeah, I did though. We do Christmas Eve at my grandma's, and so obviously, what do you do on Christmas? Eat Chinese food with the eat, family. Of course, eat Chinese food. Yeah. And so I had this on one end in Israel. I was a Jew. <laughs> I was a I was a Jew. I was doing Jewish things. Yeah, I was part going of the culture. to. I was going to. I had luck. We actually didn't have luck. I had hummus, falafels. I had falafel. I had the shawarma. Shawarma, yeah. I had all the Jewish things. I did all the Jewish things. But then I went to Italy, and I'm Italian. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I have this like dual identity. Um, but uh, you know, that's just that's the fun part about kind of being. I don't know if you're half. No, I'm full. Full Jewish, actually. You're full. Yeah, yeah. Mazel tov. <laughs> I still like, I mean, they don't have the best food. So, I, you know, I like other foods. So. Who doesn't have the best food? Jews? Yeah, that's not, honestly, there's not a lot of great stuff compared to uh, other cultures. Compared to Italian to food. Yeah. yeah. That's like comparing a Lamborghini right. to a Toyota. Right, right. But a Toyota is still a good car. <laughs> yeah. Hey, come to Phoenix and I'll take you to Chompies and that. Okay. I'm down. <laughs> good time. <laughs> 
Oh, Jeremy, it was a great, great to have you on, man. Great to see what you guys are doing. More than baseball, everybody go check them out. But uh, thanks for being on the show, and we'll definitely be watching and supporting you in the Olympics this year, uh, this summer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that was a fun episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, Jeremy's really a, a funny guy, and he's got he's done a lot of stuff in his. I mean, he barely played in the minors, and and look at all the stuff he's done outside of that. So, um, really cool episode with Jeremy. Um, and I hope you guys check out morethanbaseball.org. Just give it a look. You know, I can say firsthand, minor leaguers get treated like crap. So, um, I, I guess anything you can do if you want to donate to their cause, because uh, it's it's definitely a good thing. So. Uh, anyway, you can always follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter at Two Tall Sports. Go ahead and check out the YouTube channel, Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can subscribe there, hit the bell notification, and uh, it'll let you know every time we drop an episode, which is usually on Thursday mornings. And uh, you can follow us on Apple Podcasts as well. Subscribe there. Scroll all the way down. Hit the five stars if you already uh, have not done so. Please do that uh, when you get the chance. That'd be great to help us out so we can get on that new and noteworthy on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we're on Spotify if you want to listen there. Pandora, Amazon Music, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. Uh, thanks again for listening and uh, enjoy your day. We'll see you next time for another great episode. See ya.